My talk is called Class Composition, Knowledge Work, and Contemporary Techno Science. Um, so I want to start with my talk with an image from a site that's become important for my dissertation research. Um, so here you see a group of laborers brought down to the Brent ice shelf, a floating ice sheet that hangs off the edge of the Antarctic landmass. These laborers were temporarily contracted by the multinational engineering firm ACOM, brought down to Cape Town, South Africa for construction type trials and then lived and worked upon the ice shelf for the course of several months in 2013, setting up the sixth iteration of the British Antarctic Survey's Haley Research Station, which is a crucial site for global climate and atmospheric research. Um, and I'll just note that uh, doctoral research doing work down there made the point in a kind of writing of theirs that um, most of the people at this like very sort of recognized science base are operational laborers. Um, so I bring this up to say, um, to assert an underlying proposition that guides much of what the rest of this paper will be concerned with. Um, contemporary techno science across academic and industrial forms and instances is very often and very substantially carried out by waged laborers, very often themselves with precarious and temporary relations to the terms of their employment. And I think this really goes well with what Ali was talking about. Um, but this can be asserted, I would suggest, as a function of the historically specific, generalized, real subsumption of techno science labor, of techno scientific labor. This is to say, techno scientific labor frequently in various ways served the ends of value generation, as well as broader capitalist and colonial logics, and acted itself as a site of profit throughout much of the era of capitalist development. But at the same time, the work of science and technology could at least to a substantial degree be carried out by practitioners acting with degrees of intellectual, practical and material autonomy from the dictates of the wage form. Um, and so a contention underlying this paper is that the tendential effects of techno science is real subsumption under capital more and more completely organizes both the conditions of the work of techno science and the direct ends to which techno science is put. And I'll say these are speculative propositions, not something that we can take for granted in hearing comprehensively now in techno science, but rather tendential elements of ongoing capitalist restructuring and processes of proletarianization that I want to bring up so that we can latch onto them as they might allow for possible novel sites of contestation. Um, the basic question that then follows for me from this contention is as follows. What would it mean to compose techno-scientific workers and knowledge workers more generally as class subjects and as part of a wider proletariat? Um, so with this opening contention and the question it begs in place, um, I present here a brief outline of the paper. I'll start by working through the notion of class composition, which is central to the understanding of class capital and political struggle that underlies this talk. I'll turn then to some insights for thinking about the class composition of knowledge work drawn from what I'm going to argue. Um, uh, and so this is a particular project for me in class composition, the UC COLA strikes of um, 2019 and 2020. And finally, I'll initiate some largely speculative thinking with the aim of putting pressure on standard accounts of how leftists approach the problems presented by ongoing and heightening ecological crises and arguing for a framing of these prop problems in terms of class composition, workers inquiry and material struggle. Um, so to get into the first part, let me just get my notes. Um, so talking about class composition, um, this will be an admittedly short and perhaps reductive foray into class composition theory, focused mainly on drawing out lines of thought that will be useful going forward in the talk. Um, Class composition theory emerged in the midst of worker struggles in post-war Italy, so I'll also be turning to some Italians. Um, associated in large part with writing statements, pamphlets, and investigations carried out by thinkers such as Mario Tronti, Antonio Negri, Sergio Bologna, and Silvia Federici, um, class composition theory reflects the efforts of Italian Mar Marxists of the era to reckon with and situate the possibilities for workers' action and autonomy in relation to ongoing post-war capitalist restructuring that over the course of several decades consolidated and then decomposed Fordist production models. For Tronti, as he notes in Workers and Capital, the received wisdom of the worker struggle tied to earlier notions of cons consciousness and intellectual vanguardism and more recently to, in his own time, to humanist approaches to Marx um, was insufficient for thinking about the historically specific and recognizingly changing constitution of capital labor and their relations. So to think about why this was, um, I'll point out sort of five 
key points of class composition theory in my own understanding of it. Um, so one, at the most basic level and in an abstracted sense, the structural determination of class position per Marx falls back to the separation of people from the means of production, and thus the necessity that wage labor mediates access to means of subsistence. But there's a wide variance in just how people for whom this abstract structural determination holds are integrated within the social relations of capitalism in any particular historical juncture. This is a variance or dis differentiation found within what class composition theorists refer to as the technical composition of capital. This differentiation intersects with everything from gender, racial, and national identity, all of which have factored into how and where people are positioned in relation to wage labor, as well as violent mechanisms of state and capital disciplining, necess necessities for relocation, et cetera. Technical composition also intersects with the particular and variable kinds of labor that capital calls for in generating value at any given moment. It intersects with variable relations of workers to the wage and thus the distinctions between full, part-time, precarious, and unemployment. And holistically then it intersects with the material and social conditions of work and of life more broadly and the particular experience of capitalist contradiction and material need that individuals encounter. So second point, the negative side of this um, for class composition theorists is that there's no inherently unified class subject ready to be ignited by consciousness raising efforts through which they come to recognize themselves as teleologically destined revolutionary political subjects. Differently positioned proletarians experience capitalist contradiction at very different levels and face a set of heterogeneous material needs that don't always self-evidently align. Um, then the constructive side of this, my third point, um, comes out of the recognition that the contradictions that amass an ever denser web when, um, that these contradictions are usable. So Mario Tronti says, capitalists, capitalist contradictions should neither be rejected nor resolved, but only utilized. Class composition theorists sought to contingently construct into a political composition those recognized as class subjects within the particular technical composition imposed by capital of labor and its exploitation. And this is maybe the key point for me, um, though I don't have it like written here. It's part of point three, but political subjects are made in their everyday relations to the historically specific material contradictions or material conditions and contradictions they face at the site of those contradictions. Um, so further point, what's difficult is that those sites and conditions as well as the technical composition of labor more generally change as capital restructures in response to the advances of attuned political struggle. Classes are composed and subsequently decomposed both from the side of capital and the side of the proletariat. This necessitates, and I take this as a key element of class composition theory as well, ongoing inquiry to help elucidate the particular technical composition and the contradictions lying therein, the modes of spontaneous struggle and organization that proletarians take up, and ways that these can be stitched together into the contingent coordination of politically composed class subjects. Um, this is why for a theorist like Tronti, the project of class composition itself has something of a speculative forward-facing character without necessary reverence to pass down wisdom of past worker struggle, and part of how I'm licen licensing my own speculative gestures in this paper. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next part, um, which is on UC's COLA strikes. Um, you can see a picture. Um, I think this is from Santa Cruz. Um, so now that I've given an overview of class composition, I turn in this portion of the talk to thinking about a particular site of struggle around the conditions of contemporary knowledge work, specifically the 2019-2020 UC COLA or cost of living adjustment strikes that started at UC Santa Cruz and spread in various ways to the other UC campuses. My aim will be to think through some specific observations of these struggles with class composition acting as a kind of lens for drawing out conditions and hearing within and at times specific to knowledge work. The aim in the following section will then be to consider how insights from these observations might bear on the more particular, but also wider arena of climate and ecological te techno-scientific labor. Um, so again, five key points. Um, the first, and I'm not going to expand on this um, for time's sake, but I'll leave it to your imagination. Um, the technical composition and the contradictions faced by graduate student laborers in a university spanning 10 schools are complex. Um, so very quickly, um, you can imagine contradictions across department, division, 
um, funding structure, all of these kinds of things playing into that complexity. Um, so I'm going to move to the second point, which I will expand on. Um, this complexity was further exacerbated by geographic di differentiation across the state and by crises not specific to the university. Um, so I mentioned campus differentiation, or I didn't mention it um, actually a moment ago, um, but I'll mention it now. And I would suggest um, this is one especially potent site of differentiation within the larger technical composition that makes up the UC. Um, the strikes that happened emanated from Santa Cruz for specific reasons related to the effects of campus differentiation. As a campus situated in a small city with limited housing that increasingly competes with that of the Bay Area as the most expensive across the country, UC Santa Cruz sets students in a position of facing a uniquely high cost of living, one that can be and was compared to that of other campuses across the state. At the same time, graduate student instructors and TAs, which represent a large percentage of graduate student laborers in the UCs, are organized into a statewide union that bargains collectively for all such workers, and thus wage rates are even before discretionary department adjustments across all campuses. If, as Mark suggests, wages are theoretically pegged under capitalism to the cost of reproducing one's labor power, averaged out, out across the state, this meant that Santa Cruz students acutely faced the effects of being paid under the costs of reproduction. That this was the case had been expressed in a contentious debate among graduate student workers across the state over the terms of the 2018 contract set settlement, which granted a 3% yearly raise through the four year duration of the contract, approximately even with inflation. Um, and so Santa Cruz graduate student laborers, including those in campus level union leadership were among the strongest dissenters to this contract settlement and the strongest advocates for reframing worker militancy at the U UCs at a campus by campus level. Um, so that's just to say at the level of contradictions faced by graduate student workers and resulting in a growing strike action, there was the bosses, the UC itself, but also um, contradictions at a much more sort of micro scale and statewide union leadership as a point of contradiction that people um, came to face. So third point, the practical problems of building and maintaining militant organization towards and within a strike were problems of connecting and composing political subjects across complexity. Um, so despite the particularity of the conditions at Santa Cruz, their efforts upon initiating a wildcat strike turned quickly to the problem of spreading the strike across difference, both difference within Santa Cruz's graduate student body and across UC campuses. Within days of the vote to strike at Santa Cruz, an organizer from that campus, so this is just sort of one example of me thinking about using contradictions here, um, but an organizer from Santa Cruz came to Berkeley to meet both interested student, um, to meet with interested students, several of whom then formed an initial core of Berkeley COLA organizers. That organism, precisely because of issues with housing access in Santa Cruz, um, had begun to live and work in the East Bay. Um, and so this is a case of a sort of contradiction in housing access becoming usable within the struggle to spread the strike to Berkeley. Um, as movements towards the strike at Berkeley began to grow in preceding months, departments became loci for organization, often wielding informal organizing connections and infrastructures developed and facing contradictions within the department, while also wielding the natural connections that departments created between graduate students. This is also key um, as at Santa Cruz, and I also experienced this in my department, full strike solidarity within a department proved to be really effective as a mechanism to prevent repression from faculty and administration and even to bridge support with faculty in certain cases. Um, difficulties and limitations were faced in maintaining relations and organizational structures across departments and fanning out to larger, often STEM and engineering departments in many cases, with wider variants in how students received funding and where students were located in relation to classes, labs, PIs, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, we used a departmental organizing model and part of what I want to sort of like the key point I want to come to is that the units um, in hearing in the specific technical composition of grad labor at Berkeley and the UC more generally departments an academic building a lab. Um, these became at once the tools for a project of composition and the gaps and contradictions themselves to bridge. Um, so. Part four, again, I'm going to leave to your imagination because um, it'll 
probably be familiar, but the COVID-19 pandemic engendered a rapid shift in the technical composition of graduate student labor that had a substantial decomposing effect. Um, we all suddenly were online and not seeing each other. Um, and this is part of the technical composition of capital, even if it's engendered in the context of, um, of this sort of uh, extra social disaster. Um, and then part five was inquiry was and remains key to compositional efforts among knowledge workers in the university. Um, and I think this is really, really key. While COLA organizing as a project of composition was working, what facilitated it was ongoing inquiry, inquiry into the particular situation of the UC as personification of capital in multiple senses, namely as both boss and landlord throughout California, aided substantially in the art initial articulation of demands around a cost of living adjustment. Organizers at Santa Cruz came to recognize the double imposition of the UC, both keeping pay low and playing a substantial role in setting market rate for housing across the state, a double impos imposition that was then leveraged really effectively for agitational purposes, and research, research and inquiry into the structure and funding mechanisms of departments played a key role in developing a departmental organizing model and bringing the model to a greater and greater number of departments. Precisely because class composition analysis demands that we don't take the identity of graduate student worker or, or of worker more generally for granted as a source of unity or felt contradiction, Responsive inquiry into the conditions of distinctly positioned workers become a crucial hinge around which organization, agitation, and contingent composition become possible. So with that all in mind, I'm going to move to the third part, um, techno-scientific labor and environmental care. And so in the last part of the talk, I want to initiate an effort to think through a project of environmental care in the midst of present and oncoming ecological catastrophe in the terms of class composition of techno-scientific labor. Part of what mot motivates this is a level of dissatisfaction with the commonly appealed to political forms through which climate politics are, refra are refracted. So recognizing the severe limitations of liberal climate accords pitched within the framework of a sustainable capitalism to which could be added neo-imperial mechanisms within these accords for disciplining global South nations in service of the global North. Um, left common sense in the US has gravitated for several years around the popular notion of a Green New Deal. Broadly referring in the US to ambitious policy proposals for rehabilitating industry and employment access through widespread investment in sustainable technologies that would decarbonize American infrastructure and energy use, the Green New Deal faces critiques from right and left. Critiques that suggest from one direction um, that it's a politically unworkable ideal and from another that it fails to reimagine consumptive habits in the US and the global north more generally and would necess necessitate dramatic expansions of rare mineral, mineral extractive economies at the expense largely of laborers and indigenous communities throughout the so global south. So I wanna say, um, I don't wanna throw out the Green New Deal as an imaginary or a project altogether, um, because I think it's really fruitful and beneficial, but I would suggest there's truth to both of these critiques. Um, Meaningfully ambitious climate policy requires organized political will against fossil capital sites of power, a will I'm not sure exists except in diffuse form. And the Green New Deal imaginary as initially framed retains the productivist instincts of the historical project it rhetorically calls upon without necessarily asking after a corresponding social and political will, will away from toilsome work, resource extraction and mass consumption at present scales. Um, my suspicion as well from my own academic research into the material and social conditions of possibility of climate research is to think that the Green New Deal as rhetorical frame um, and as it's constituted now puts too, much, puts too much faith into science itself as an autonomous sphere tending towards solutions to crisis level global problems. Um, I would argue that predominant forms that climate research broadly speaking take in the present are very often tied to risk mitigation expressed in terms of management of capital and infrastructure. Um, and so I'm gonna point to an example here of what I take to be a sort of neoliberal logic at play in a lot of um, climate science as it happens. Um, and so this is a report from uh, something titled lesson, a paper titled Lessons from California's 2012 to 2016 Drought by a group of environmental engineers and watershed client scientists. Um, and what it claims is droughts in modern well-managed water systems serving globalized economies need not be economically catastrophic, 
but will always have impacts and challenges, particularly for native ecosystems. In California and every other water system, droughts usefully expose, expose weaknesses and in inadequate preparation and water management. And later in the port report, it builds towards a vision of resilience and adapt, adaptability, out of market flexibility, um, globalization, infrastructural accumulation, um, and innovation. Um, so I th think the kind of core point it's making is we have a strong enough position and connection to wider water and agricultural markets that we can absorb the worst effects of drought, um, which I think is sort of the neoliberalization of, um, of a kind of climate science, trying to think about the problem of environmental calamity. Um, so at the same time that capital's organization of science's productive output can largely be read within wider neoliberal logics, I would return to the image I started with when I took as exemplary of the capitalist organization of techno-scientific labor in the present. In thinking about the technical composition of class and capital within the sphere of environmental techno-science, we might frame these trends as aligning, and in so doing, think about this alignment as something we can use towards projects of political composition. Political composition across those more traditionally thought of as knowledge workers, scientists, for instance, positioned within the university, as well as techni technicians and laborers working in energy utilities and infrastructural sectors. This is obviously not a straightforward thought experiment under this broad umbrella of workers integrated within the wider sphere of environmental technoscience. Our groups with vastly different backgrounds, senses of their relation to science and its attendant labors, and ways of making sense of material conditions. Um, and this goes sort of back to Ollie's point, but for many of those trained in the academy, for instance, across disciplines, disciplining involves the recognition of oneself, no matter the circumstances one faces as an aspiring intellectual rather than as a contingent laborer within institutions of knowledge work. Um, so on the one hand, this appears as a question of consciousness, but it intersects directly with questions of technical composition, I would say. Um, a simple way of phrasing this is as follows. What forms of material struggle contingently unite workers of various stripes within the wider sphere of environmental technoscience? At the UC, the conditions of contingent labor roles, statewide housing crisis, crises, and tendencies in the preferred mechanisms of revenue generation at the university towards real estate development and rent extraction coalesced around a particular demand, a cost of living adjustment articulated in relation to geographically uneven housing costs. Crucially, this coalescence was forged and articulated by imaginative thinking and particularized inquiry among graduate student workers situated in especially dire circumstances. We might think about a like articulation of coalescing causes and sites for struggle, struggle that would hold together growingly immiserating conditions for techno-scientific knowledge work, the forms of environmental precarity and harm that people increasingly face in their everyday lives, and the capitalist logics under which environmental techno-scientific labor is subsumed. What would be key then is making these coalescing tendencies in the technical composition of capital and its wider effects into a real site of material struggle that techno-scientific workers might act on within sites of production and that they might act on as a function of the material struggles and contradictions they face in their own lives. Um, the inquiries that might facilitate such a project specifically for knowledge workers in environmental techno-science could ask, is this the work you want to be doing and the conditions under which you want to be doing it? What do you see as necessary for staving off environmental calamities? And is the work you're able to do in the present capable of addressing that? What conditions would facilitate responsible environmental techno-science in the present and in facing down an imperiled future? Um, questions might also ask more sort of basic things. Who provides funding for this kind of work? To whom, to what extent, and under what conditions? What effect does this have on the work you're doing and the experience you have of doing it? And key then would also be to ask about how such knowledge workers interface with the wider gamut of technical and operational laborers integrated into attendant industries like energy and infrastructure. These are in certain ways speculative questions for which the task of consolidating and articulating axes of struggle around answers may be thorny and take a level of creative maneuvering. But I would suggest asking them might open onto some of the initial steps of composing a class of environmental techno-scientific workers who are prepared to struggle for conditions of genuine environmental care, not captured by the sub substantive tendencies of capitalism in the face of ecological crisis. Um, questions that could start to articulate a future like that seen in this sort of joking final image I'll leave you with. Um, 
and we can end there. Um, and yeah. Thank you, Spencer. Um, an image that's going to stick with me for a while. I'm going to turn it over to Charles for uh, his response. Okay, thank you very much. That was uh, that was very enlightening for me. Um, I will, I'll, I'll begin again by uh, trying to hit the main points. Uh, although you outlined so clearly, it almost feels redundant. Uh, still, I think it might help get a uh, whole conversation started. Okay, so uh, you uh, you began by making uh, what for me was a very useful point that you know not all the people who participate in let's say a research base in Antarctica are, are researchers. A lot of it is operational personnel, which, um, which, makes, uh, which makes an extremely important uh, point available, which is that uh, you know, under the conditions in which uh, techno science is actually carried out, its subsumption under capital uh, requires uh, its organization with respect both to the means by which the work is uh, carried out and also the aims towards which it's, it, it's put. And, uh, and that produces uh, a certain kind of differentiation within it. And even in a certain way, a kind of derangement of its purpose that needs to be uh, taken into account when we think about uh, how we wanna to respond to it politically. So um, you uh, take a little detour into class composition theory uh, which I will not get into uh, in great detail, detail because apparently unlike the, the two of you who I'm to respond to, uh, I have very little uh, background in post-war Italian Marxist thought. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> if I may just hit the highlights, it, uh, it seems to me that the basic idea is the temp technical composition of, uh, of the, uh, the working class means that we're, we're dealing with people who are in different positions in relation to the, uh, the, the, the capitalist society in which, in which they're working and in different relations to the, to the relations of production that, uh, that govern them. Therefore, their interests won't always align, their, their needs won't always align, their sense of who they are won't always align and bringing them, into, uh, bringing them into some kind of useful collaboration, that becomes kind of the big issue, right? Um, one, of the, uh, one, of the, one of the key instruments uh, you, you, you outline um, in, uh, in the response to this challenge. This challenge, which I should also acknowledge is sometimes an opportunity as in the case, uh, for instance, of, uh, of UC Santa Cruz workers who find themselves in the East Bay and who therefore uh, build out of their desperation a kind of a natural bridge to another, uh, to another set of, uh, uh, of workers uh, in a different, um, in a different milieu. Uh, one key tool in, uh, in overcoming this uh, difficulty or facing this challenge is inquiry. Um, that is inquiry uh, both into the institutions that are creating and uh, articulating these circumstances and into the concrete situations of the various workers um, who participate in them. As a case, uh, you, uh, you examine the, the, the Green New Deal, which although is not perfect, um, and uh, to which serious objections can be made, uh, you, you articulate a fundamental one, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, seeing, uh, seeing it not as depending on an autonomous and uh, as it were self-directed uh, scientific organ, uh, as rather being something that is uh, conditioned by the needs of the, uh, the capitalist society in which it's, uh, in which it's written. Therefore, uh, its uh, responses to the coming climate crisis are skewed toward uh, finding, uh, finding means for flexibility and, uh, and toward uh, mitigating risk. All of which leads me all of which leads me to, uh, to the set of questions you, you uh, articulate toward the end, right? And toward the, uh, toward the, the way you imagine uh, a response to this. And it, and it comes down to me, uh, comes down for me uh, to an issue of, uh, of, of consciousness, right? If the challenge, if the challenge you're, you're summing up as uh, class composition is really, uh, is really confronting the failure of class consciousness, right? The failure of workers to realize that as a class, 
given their relation to, uh, to the means of production, right? They have shared interests and solidarity is really, uh, really clearly in their best interest, right? Given the failure of that, right? Because of the particularity of the, the conditions under which they labor and of the, the challenges they face, um, the, key, the, key, the key system of response seems to be inquiry. That is, to, uh, that is to, 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 to gain and to share a clear understanding of these circumstances. And what I'm wondering is, what is the difference between this more fully articulated uh, uh, awareness through inquiry and something that would be like class consciousness, right? With more detail. Is it, is it just a really detailed class consciousness? Or, uh, or perhaps, you could, perhaps you could elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, this is an interesting point, and um, uh, one I'll try to sort of think through in real time. Um, because I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Maybe I could just maybe I could just say one more thing that would make responding simpler. Yeah. Like, insofar as inquiry is aimed at articulating the specificity of various uh, members of the technical composition of of the the working class. Insofar as it's aimed at uncovering the particularity of their situations, could it could it possibly drive us away from class consciousness into individual situations? Anyway, go ahead. That's that's a really interesting um, way of thinking about this. So, one thing I'll say as a kind of starting point is, um, I think when class composition theory was developed, it did understand itself as, in some sense, a, not opposed, not necessarily opposing, but trying to supersede um, what had had a sort of over, like a large effect over Italian communist and Marxist thought, which was Gramsci, and which was this kind of like um, intellectual vanguard. Uh, like consciousness based model of thinking about what organizing was. And for me, I think I, I don't like, I think you're right to point out that what is marked here as a distinction is less a like hard and fast distinction with hard and fast different models um, and more and more can be thought of as an effort to fill in something that just articulating something like co consciousness itself maybe is missing or like can't comprehend. I think that's really uh, uh, a good way of framing it. And what I would just say is one of the things that I think like class composition theorists um, try to think about um, is uh, People already in the workplaces are collecting, are collectively acting, um, even if they don't recognize it as tied to a larger project in some sense. Um, and um, they're also already in their workplaces uh, collectively integrated into certain kinds of social, like sort of relations of sociality. Um, and so, what class composition theory wants to do um, is offer uh, offer inquiry as one a mechanism of uncovering where that happens. Um, and also in doing so saying, here are material structures that already exist around which people can act um, and through which people can come to like stitch together their actions into something more like a fully composed um, like militant working class organ. Um, and I think, so that's sort of one way I think of, like, I think your reframing of this is filling in something that consciousness is in and of itself is missing, but um, still comes down to a matter of consciousness ultimately, um, sounds right to me. Um, but I think, yeah, um, I think for me, what this has been helpful to think with is ways in which this is also a model about identifying material structures that exist around which people act um, rather than purely subjective structures. Um, 
in part because I think there's often a problem, not just of people not having consciousness, but especially in something like the university workplace, people having consciousness on the face of it. And this is sort of what I think Ali was talking about, consciousness on the face of it that doesn't translate into possibilities for collective action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carl, you. I'll respond quickly. I just want to actually open up moderation to you three panelists. There are two questions. And if any of you would like to choose one, um, perhaps after Charles, you respond, let me know and then we can let them ask their question. Oh, I thought Spencer's response to my to my to my to my query was 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 very complete. I'm happy to go to the questions. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start with um, I think a question that was directly for this panel, and hopefully we can get back to um, Sarah's question from the last panel. So, um, Tobia, I'm going to let you ask your question. Hi, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Thank you for the feedback. Um, thank you so much for um, both talks. This is really a lot to think about and it's um, extremely inspiring. I was actually thinking um, yeah, about the dimension of social reproduction, like the very gender dimension of social reproduction as um, yeah, just a thought as a heuristic, how might that maybe help to bring together um, like radical research inside the university um, with organizing through um, academic labor and struggles beyond or even outside the university, like within um, like the COVID sort of um, madness, we've seen that, you know, there's some um, academics that actually publish so much more than before. And there's others that actually drop out that get, um, um, that get, yeah, caught out, um, that get just, lose their jobs um, in academia. So there's yeah really different um, labor conditions inside academia. And I was just yeah thinking um, or wanted to ask you if you reckon that yeah the dimension of social reproduction might maybe help to bring in ideas of um, mutuality, interdependence and caring in this sort of um, yeah discussion. Thank you. Um, I can start by saying, one, I think this is a really good question that um, I really want to and should think through more, especially as I try to frame kind of what I was speaking to in the last part as a matter of environmental care. Um, and I think this is, you're pointing to something that is um, sort of also lying within what I was framing here as technical composition, which is um, uh, the fact that there are different relations reflected, refracted through gender to like historically um, in the present to waged and unlaid waged labor. Um, and that's key to getting a sort of composite pic picture of the technical composition of capital at any given moment um, is, is noting that. Um, and then to say, um, I think this is something I would, I am struggling to articulate like a solid pointed answer to um, off the bat, but I think is really, I really wanna think with um, and does strike me as like a really, really good, um, Good reframing of some of the of some of the things we brought up here. Thank you. Unless Charles or Ali wanted to uh, chip in, we have a question from Sarah Covington, who I believe may have left the conference. But um, should we turn to that now? Her question is a general one. Um, she's interested in your suggestions for concrete measures that faculty can take in helping students organize, including across universities, and in convincing colleagues to disentangle themselves from their psychophancy to administrators. Uh, 
Um, I think I, I just wanted to quickly say that, I mean, I'm not located in the US, so, um, um, but I mean, the thing that comes to my mind, just look at concrete examples that have been successful, right? For instance, I think if I'm not mistaken at Rutgers University, there was a successful sort of unionization like in, in COVID times or I mean, there are people out there who are just sort of um, sharing their experience, but I mean, um, you know, starting from the, the whatever that is there, if there is like a union in, in the university or if there is like sort of a structure to work with, I would start from, from that. And I think it, it is to an extent, you know, the question whether um, generally speaking, um, I mean, it's a really general question in a way that we should be, in, in politics, the equivalent would be that should we turn into electoral politics or should we just like completely quit electoral politics and go to, you know, go for revolution hardcore. <laughs> but I think I would start with whatever existing structure that is there and look at successful examples. This, um... This might sound a little anecdotal, but um, it's the best I have to offer. You know, during during the COVID crisis and in part response to it, uh, some of the non-tenure eligible faculty at William and Mary uh, were uh, either not continued, not given new contracts, or uh, threatened with non-continuation. In response to that. Um, uh, some colleagues uh, and I had looked into the, our, our local chapter of the American Association of University Professors as the closest thing we had to, uh, to unionization. I mean, Virginia's for public, uh, for public employees anyway, essentially a right to work state. It's very, very difficult to form a union and it's, it would be a political victory to gain collective bargaining rights for a union uh, of public employees at an institution of higher learning in Virginia. So uh, what, what we discovered was starting with that existing, with that existing uh, institution and then uh, trying to, to get people not even to join, but just to show up and uh, ask questions, engage in inquiry, try to discover the various ways that non-tenure eligible faculty were being used at the uh, university and the different rules that were, uh, that were used to govern their employment in different departments. This is all information nobody had before, and which uh, and which has has given us a clearer vision of what kind of response we have to make to the present situation, because uh, it, it it is not laid out clearly in some handbook someplace. It's all ad hoc structures. It's all contingency, and it's all uh, 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 opaque. So um, I think getting together and talking within whatever existing framework there is for organization uh, is, is, is maybe the only way to begin.